Hi, I'm Susan Moeller. I'm at the uh, University of Maryland, and we have a core course for the last five years at, at Maryland. We've probably taught about 1,500 students in media literacy since then. And I really wanted to speak to, perhaps to all of you. Um, Susan, could you put the microphone a little closer? Sorry, I wanted to really speak to, to all of the presidents about how you see integrating uh, news literacy, media literacy into your, your, uh, your university settings. Because one of the things that I see from my perspective, and I have a bit of an international perspective, is a need for a plurality of voices. And I think that universities can really assist in that process of helping to educate uh, students that it's not only determining what the right voice is, but it's, re but it's, it's understanding that there's a need for multiple voices. Mm -hmm. And by integrating media literacy, not only as a standalone course, but as a core component in other kinds of courses, you begin to get that out. So it's not only bringing everyone into the Newhouse School or into um, the school here, but it's in a sense like ethics. Ethics used to be a standalone course in one place, and now we have ethics in, in med school and B school and so forth. So uh, to, to sort of sum up, I, I guess what I would say is bring the different perspectives of multiple disciplines into a new house school, but also integrate media literacy, news literacy into other, uh, other disciplines as a way of of speaking to those other disciplines. Uh, and I wonder if, if, if you all would just very briefly comment on whether that's something that is sort of getting traction in your, in your areas. I, I'll just very briefly comment. Um, I actually meant that when I said the two-way street. I mean, so it's partly with community, but it's also across the disciplines. I think of this as not dissimilar. You mentioned ethics. I think of it as not dissimilar to the notion of writing across the curriculum. So in right. fact, I'm a social psychologist. One of the things we do at Syracuse is we have an incredible curriculum about intergroup relations, cultural fluency, the kinds of international perspective that you want when different standpoints come to bear. News literacy could be perfectly integrated into that kind of curriculum that goes across various schools and colleges. So I absolutely applaud what you're saying. I'll just come comment, if I may, that I totally agree that uh, it's integration. I was listening to this morning's discussion more from the standpoint of how, how this is integrated across the various areas of the university. I know one of the most powerful lessons I had in my own uh, upbringing about uh, news, what I'd call news literacy, was in an agricultural cooperatives course. And when the instructor, very you know, using critical thinking and logic, simply looked at a uh, an editorial and said, rip this apart. You know, we did a critical analysis of it. So we need faculty doing that and to speak to what John Lombardi was talking about earlier. Uh, it builds on ethics, it builds on logic, it builds on uh, critical thinking, just as writing across the curriculum has. And I do think uh, it's important to particularly emphasize some of this in our colleges of education. And I know we had a teacher speaking a moment ago uh, when I like to think of uh, John Rawls at Harvard, a great, great philosopher, who said, when we look at ed the ed force of education, we are really creating ourselves. We're creating our, the, the future of our society. And unless uh, we are looking at all these factors of uh, ethics, logic, critical thinking in, in our colleges of education, uh, particularly producing that next generation of teachers that are going to go out there pre-K-12 uh, and, and produce those students who are going to come into our universities. We, we start failing at that level if we don't pursue it. Absolutely. OK, right over there. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Sheila Teft uh, from Emory University in Atlanta. Um, we're a liberal arts college with a small journalism program. And being a liberal arts college, there is no way we are going to get the university to require this course. So we're placed in a position of basically selling this idea to the students. And um, we're starting a news literacy course in the fall, but we're not calling it news literacy, <laughs> we're calling it the digital news revolution. So I think it's important here to keep in mind that these are kids who don't have role models as consumers of news. Probably unlike most of us in this uh, auditorium, they didn't grow up seeing their, paper, their parents reading one or two newspapers. Um, 
nor talking about the news around the dinner table. And so I think we have to keep this in mind, um, especially since probably a lot of us are in the position of having to market this to the students. I know academics don't like to hear that, but that's a reality. So I'd like to hear your ideas on how do we market this idea to the students. Well, <clears throat> let me just, just briefly um, uh, respond. I, I think uh, that you have a key point here. We uh, have only a fixed amount of time uh, to indoctrinate our students on all the things we think they ought to know. And uh, people like us uh, go from group to group, and each group has an agenda of things that are absolutely critical that every undergraduate should know. They should know ethics, and they should know philosophy, and they should know science, and they should know math, and they should know English, and they should know foreign language, and they should go abroad, and they should do news media, and they should do news literacy. And everybody has a set of courses that they want to require everybody to take so that they will have these important values. And we all agree they're important values, but we are constrained by the practical realities of time and space. And of course, many of us in the public sector and a few in the private sector as well are finding that our sponsors do not want us to expand either the time or the space. In fact, many of them want us to contract the time and the space. So part of this conversation is a competitive conversation within the university community about which way of presenting ideas and, uh, and programs and courses and activities will compete for the time and the space that the student has available. So when we fight in the curriculum committee, this is a formal structure for creating the competition amongst various perspectives on what ought to be in a liberal arts education fit within the 120, 24 credit hours that we've got to pack into the student's knowledge. And so marketing these activities is critically important. Marketing it to the students, marketing it to our faculty, marketing it to the external world to recognize that this creates graduates who are better prepared uh, for their either future careers in professional studies or their career immediately in the job market. So it's all about selling the story. And that's what he's done so well. Right? He's created an enterprise here that sells a story. It raises money, it speaks to a wide, wide variety of students, so it generates credit hours. It co-ops other faculty members who get a vested interest in participating in the program. It does all of the things that a high-powered marketing operation would do. And being a news guy, he knows he's got to sell the news because the news has to be sold, otherwise there's no newspaper. And so consequently, he's out there doing that marketing activity. This is a tremendous marketing show we had here today. And so he's putting that on. He's putting that on for 1,000 students, OK? And he wants those students to take the story right, and take it to their fellow students and sell it by word of mouth, which is the best way to sell stuff, as we all know, in the marketplace. So he's given us a model of how to go about doing this. All right, so I think that's a, that's a very important part of, of, of this process. Second thing I'd like to say is I think <clears throat> I think we're in a process in our universities of doing a lot of deconstructing, right? a lot of deconstructing. We're deconstructing all kinds of structures in our university that we used to take as permanent and sacrosanct people in consolidating budgets and saving money or collapsing departments. They're trying to eliminate structures. They're trying to reorganize things, and they have high intellectual explanations for what they're doing, but in fact, they're squeezing cost out of the system. And you have to squeeze cost out of the system because there's no escape from squeezing costs. So when you squeeze cost out of the system, you look for things that can serve multiple constituencies with one price. Right? And this is one of those kinds of things, right? It's a very efficient operation at 1,000 students. And if you can just get the damn thing online, he's going to make a bucket of money for the university. This is going to be a good thing. Right? So you don't want to ever forget that. 